So, Tripp emphasizes the role of the passion, and that that's largely lacking in the mainline church. John Cobb writes similarly about being lukewarm, citing uh, Revelation 3. Do you guys think that that's important, or is it a, a red herring? Well, uh, I don't know if I'd say it's a red herring. I do think it's important, but I don't know if it's enough, because I think, I mean, I was raised uh, very conservative evangelical and had lots of passion uh, on the conservative side, but also I've encountered and seen a lot of passion on, on the quote-unquote liberal side, which neither of which had the kind of traction, I think, that you're trying to, to point toward, Philip, and which I uh, want to. So, so passion is good and, I would say, a necessary but not sufficient condition. Mm -hmm. Because lots of liberals get, um, I mean, in other words, did, what did that change? How did that change society? It may have affected a particular woman, or I mean, it, maybe it did affect a congressman or something. But I mean, it didn't undo, it didn't disjoin the structures that hold together and push apart uh, our society in ways that, that are oppressive. To, to do that, we need passion. But I think we, we're going to need something else. Um, as I was listening to your presentation and the others this afternoon at the AAR session, the two things that, that came to my mind are, I think, we need, and there'll be a lot more than this that we need, but to pay attention to developmental issues, mm. as I say what I mean by that briefly, and also a lot more attention to interreligious issues, mm. if interreligious is even the right question. Um, so. I'll just say the interreligious one briefly because I don't know as much what I'm talking about here. I haven't done as, as much research on it. Um, simply to say the church, I think, is a red herring. In my view, there's no such thing as the church. Uh, all we have are churches, and within churches, splits and separations and people who sometimes come and don't come and, uh, are, you know, and all these issues. So, so to say the church with a unitary voice and if we could do something, you know what I mean? It's going to be... It's, any traction is not going to be the church having traction in the society anymore mm -hmm. uh, because of the plurality of religious belongings. That seems fair. Yeah. The, the more yeah, that's, that's what I'm, that's what I was also. I mean, I agree with you. That's what I was trying to say. Is and you, you probably have... and you probably know. I mean, you all know more about interreligious dialogue than I do. I'm just sort of entering that discussion. But developmentally, I want to say something briefly about this. Something I see missing so often in uh, not just interreligious dialogue, but in Christian theology, uh, even in most seminaries, is uh, an attention to the fact that people developmentally are going to respond to particular Christian ideas, Christian actions. They're going to understand the word society differently. They're going to understand the retraction differently. And this means, uh, I don't just mean developmentally children, adolescents, mm -hmm. which is important for pedagogical reasons, but even adults are, are developmentally, and this is, people don't like to hear this because it makes them nervous, but people just interpret things differently. And unless and until our theology can include that intuition and be sensitive and nuanced to, to the fact that it's not just uh, there's the church, it's not the Christian, hmm. the progressive Christian. Yeah. Every person has their own uh, developmental stage and way of taking and holding on to the world. And so uh, one of the steps I think we have to take t as we go forward is thematizing that and drawing mm -hmm. it into our theology. Okay, okay. now um, I want to see before we run out of time if I can weave together Steve's major charge and the, this dual complexification that you've just thrown in, the interreligious and the developmental, the sort of universally developmental aspect that you put in. And if we, in, if we really acknowledge how complex the actual situation is, and then we try to formulate some theology which is true to where people are, true to biblical documents and history of Christian thought, and really um, accurate as a guide to concrete political decision making and policy making in Washington, D.C. I think that's a recipe for failure. I think there's something about that way of conceiving the task. So if, if pro, well, I, I want to say progressive, Laurent doesn't like it, if progressive Christianity has to do that to be considered successful, we've built in failure from the start. So what if, um, this, is a, I, this is an idea I'd like to explore with you and see if, how you'd respond. What if we move the level of where the Christian contribution is up one level of abstraction? So we acknowledge huge difference, huge difference among the actors, but we are part of a political process. There are, you know, a hundred senators. There are so and so many members of the House of Representatives, and the it's not in specific policies which are Christian or anti-Christian. To me, that's the superficial nature of the response of the right. But rather, there are broader guiding principles 
for how one approaches the issues. So Steve and I talked recently about the Afghanistan-Iraq conflicts and looked for the Christian position not in a Quaker pacifism, I won't touch violence, or a simplistic because of God and Christianity, therefore we have to get the Taliban, but broader principles of diplomacy, of building international partnerships and collaboration, of um, uh, utilizing all peaceful means first, Though, and one could argue that those sorts of principles could have grounding in Christianity. That's the proposal I'd like to have you guys criticize or elaborate.